So welcome to our explanation of yes and. What performing improv has taught me about collaborative IT. Uh, my name is Glenn Anderson. I work in IBM Lab Services and training. You know, pretty much for my entire IBM career, I have been a system specialist, an IT consultant, sort, sorts of jobs. But what some of you probably don't know is that for most of my adult life, I have also performed improvisational comedy. And in fact, back in my 20s and 30s, I was a member of an improvisational comedy troupe here in Chicago where I live called the Nightlight Players, and we performed at a comedy club in Chicago every weekend for many, many years. So just to prove to you I'm not making that up, here's a picture of me, the troupe that I was in back in my 20s and 30s. Can you find me in this picture? <laughs> Actually, I said that to a group a few weeks ago when I was doing this session, and someone said I was the dummy here uh, that he was holding. So I suppose I really shouldn't ask that question anymore. But this was the troupe, I guess, some kind of Christmas show we were doing. Here's another picture of me in some sort of Western theme thing. So that was me uh, in the Nightlight Players uh, back in my 20s and 30s. So how many of you have ever attended an improv comedy kind of show? Quite a few of you. Or have you ever watched the television show, Whose Line Is It Anyway? Well, that's, that's improv comedy, that, that, what they do on that show. And so, for example, in this picture here, uh, the actors are all out on stage, and, and one actress has stepped forward. She's talking to the audience, and probably what she's doing is asking the audience for a suggestion. And then some of the actors will step forward, and they create the scene on the fly based on that suggestion. So, you know, she might be asking for a location where the scene's going to take place, or maybe a, a, an actor and an actress step forward and, and you ask the audience, well, what's their relationship? Are they a husband and wife, brother and sister? You know, what are they? Or maybe you ask for an object and someone yells out, you know, lawnmower. And so you end up creating a scene around the idea of a lawnmower. I mean, that's the idea of how improv scenes get created in an improv comedy show. So let me begin by telling you a little story about uh, once that happened to me when I was with the Nightlight Players. One night, uh, my partner Chris and I, we step on stage, and we're going to create an Im improvised scene, and we decided that we were going to ask for a location. Now, when you ask for a location as a suggestion, this can be a little iffy. Sometimes people yell something like, France. Well, that's kind of tough. I mean, how do you do a scene, you know, around France? Uh, better would be Paris, you know, now you're getting a little more specific. Even better would be underneath the Eiffel Tower. You know, now you're really getting something specific that kind of generates the idea for a scene. So that night we asked for the suggestion of a location, and we got a really great location suggestion. The suggestion was a corner office in a high-rise office building. So that's, that's a great suggestion. So now what happens is the two actors, we turn to each other, and one of us has to initiate the scene, get it going, by either throwing out a line of dialogue or doing something physical, you know, something that kind of gets the scene going. So I turned to my partner, Chris, and I said, thank you for coming to see me. I want to review your job performance over the last several years. Now, what did I just establish? I mean, we're in a corner office, so it sounds like I'm the boss, he's my employee, he's come in for some kind of performance review. So Chris, what he says back to me is he says, I don't have to listen to you, you're not my boss. So in one line, Chris kind of negated everything that I had created with my line. So now I'm trying to figure out how can I save this and keep it going. And so I said, well, apparently, you know, you didn't read the email. If you'd read the email, you would know that I am your boss. And he says back to me, I don't get any emails. I don't have a workstation. So again, he's negating everything that I've said. See, I needed Chris to take what I was saying and add to it. So a much better would have been if I'd said, you know, thank you for coming to see me. I want to review your job performance over the last few months. And Chris says back something like, yeah, I know. It hasn't been too good. Uh, I have a rare disease where I have to sleep 23 hours out of every day. And then I could say back to him something like, yes, but that 24th hour, I need better productivity. And then he could say, well, the problem is in the 24th hour, I'm going to the doctor to find out why I'm sleeping the other 23 hours or something like this. So now this thing is kind of rolling along and you've got you know, something happening. And so see, what I needed Chris to do in that scene is to say yes and. 
I mean, that is one of the tenets of doing good improvisation. Someone puts out a line, and then in response, you say yes, and let me build on that. You know, so I want to review your job performance. So then Chris says yes, and as a matter of fact, the reason it's so bad is I sleep 23 hours. And then I say yes, and, you know, but I need the 24th hour. So the way you get the scene going is you each give back to each other yes, and. Instead, what Chris was doing was he was saying no or saying no but, you know, I mean, he was negating what I was saying. And so this is what I want to talk about in this presentation the, as kind of the overriding theme, the idea of saying yes and, and what that can mean in, in business and, and other areas of your life. <clears throat> now, a little bit about the history of improv. Improvisational comedy really has centered for many, many years at a club in Chicago here called The Second City. And back in 1959, a group of graduate students at the University of Chicago, they all read a book that had recently been published by an author named Viola Spolin. It was called Improvisation for the Theater. And in this book, she laid out a whole bunch of techniques and exercises to use improvisation to become better actors. And they used those games that were in her book to create the whole idea of performing improvisational comedy in front of an audience. And so they started this in, in 1959. Even today, the Second City, very, very famous here in Chicago, is probably still the leading improvisational comedy organization anywhere in the world. They uh, have other franchises that they've established in other cities around the world. A lot of very famous comic actors got their start at Second City. Uh, Bill Murray, uh, Tina Fey. You remember the uh, movie a few years ago, The Blues Brothers, Dan Aykroyd, John Belushi, they started at Second City. Uh, did you all watch the television show Cheers? You remember Cheers? Remember that guy Norm that sat at the end of the bar all the time? His name was George Went. I watched George Went do many, many shows at Second City before he became famous uh, on Cheers. Uh, more recently, uh, Steve Carell, the, the comedy actor, Stephen Colbert, Nate Light, Nate Light Television. These are all people that got their start at, at Second City. Now, I had the good fortune of enrolling and participating and graduating from their training center that's called Players Workshop of Second City. So that's where I learned how to perform improvisation like Second City does. Now it's sort of interesting, when I signed up for these classes, I expected the classes were gonna be a bunch of people, aspiring actors. But instead, you had a lot of people in these classes that were business people, sales people, people that wanted to just be better in front of an audience and things like that. So it was really an interesting mix of people that were in these classes. The other thing that was interesting was some people came to these classes thinking, thinking Second City would teach them how to be funny. And Second City wasn't gonna teach you how to be funny. They were gonna show you how to do improv. You had to bring your own funny, you know? You were not, they were not gonna teach you how, how to be funny. So what is improvisational theater, improvisational comedy? Here's a definition from Wikipedia. A form of theater where most or all of what is performed is created at the moment it is performed. In its purest form, the dialogue, the action, the story, the characters are created collaboratively by the players as the improvisation unfolds in present time without the use of any kind of a script. So that's sort of a, a technical definition of improvisational theater. Or another way you could kind of distill this down, improvisational theater means creating something out of nothing. Now think about work. How often do we get asked on the job to create things out of nothing? You know, project plans or, or solve problems or, or marketing schemes or these kinds of things. So this is really not that far off from what we're all asked to do every day at work to create something out of nothing. So let me tell you a little bit more about what it's like to watch improvisational comedy. By the end of this session, you're gonna know more about improv than you ever thought possible, all right? So this is a, a scene with a bunch of actors on the stage at Second City doing an improv. Now the first thing you notice is they all look like they're holding something, but they don't have anything in their hand. And this is one of the tenets of improv, you really can't use props. Because think about this for a minute, you step out on the stage and you don't know what the scene is gonna be until you get the suggestion. So how can you bring props with you? Because you don't know what the scene is gonna be. And so this leads to some interesting things. 
For example, these guys, what do they look like? They're all kind of holding a cup, it looks like. So maybe they're at a party or something like this. And they all look like they're holding a glass in their hand. Maybe they're toasting or something. So I've got this glass in my hand. I have to pantomime this glass as I'm doing the scene. And every once in a while, you'll watch an actor, and things will get going in the scene, and pretty soon they kind of forget they're holding the glass, and it just magically disappears. <laughs> you know, one minute it's in their hand, the next minute, where did that glass go? You know, it just disappeared into, into thin air. Or another thing, you sometimes mime larger objects, like furniture. So let's say I'm standing here, and I'm pretending this is a kitchen counter, and I'm doing the dishes. And so I'm standing here miming, you know, washing dishes, drying dishes, doing that kind of thing. So I've established this sink. And then I walk away, and some a other actor comes along, doesn't realize it, walks right through my sink, you know. So, so you have to pay attention to this kind of stuff. But that's one of the things in improv is you mime all of these objects that you're using. Now, another thing is that there are rules. We're going to talk about these as we go through the session that allow the actors to improvise together, otherwise it would just be chaos. And so one actor initiates and takes the focus, and they make something happen for a while, and then when they're done, they give the focus to someone else. So you have this notion of give and take, and that's how you keep the scene moving along, because again, remember, there is no script, right? So you're making this up as you're going along. So there's initiation, there's focus, there's give and take. These are the rules that you learn and you practice when you go to a class like the Second City classes that I went to. They teach you this stuff. Another question people often ask is, well, how do you know what to say? You know, I, I have no script, you know? What should I be doing? What should I be saying? Every scene has a who, a what, and a where. So like my example scene at the beginning, the who was boss and employee. The what was a performance review, job review. The where was the corner office in the high-rise office building. So that's the given who, what, and where. So now what do you do? You just do what you would do. If you're a boss, you'd say what a boss would say. Your employee, you say what an employee would say. You would act like you're in a corner office. I mean, you use the who, the what, and the where to generate the, the action. So that's where the action kind of comes from. Now, if you go to a show at the Second City, have you ever actually been to a show at, here in Chicago at Second City? So you know the first part of the show is a pre-rehearsed set of sketches. And so these are scenes that they have created through improvisation, but they've done them over and over and over again. And so by the time they're performing them, they're almost like they do have a script. And watching that kind of show is sort of like watching Saturday Night Live, if you watch that, you know, a whole bunch of scenes, one after another, after another, pre-rehearsed. And then they take an intermission, and then they come back, and now they take suggestions and do improv, like I've been describing to you. And it's interesting, when you buy a ticket for a Second City show, you're basically paying for the first part of the show. The second part is technically free. And some people leave during the intermission, and people wait outside. And if there's empty seats, they come in, and they come in for free. So they don't charge for the improv part. They call that their failure laboratory. I mean, that's where they feel like they can get up on stage, and if the thing totally bombs, well, hey, nobody paid for it anyway, right? You came, you're free, you're taking a chance, you know? So this is where they get to really do the improv kind of stuff. All right, so that's a little bit about Second City and a little bit about improv. Any, any questions or comments about that? Why did they use the term failure? It seems like it's negative. Why, why isn't it like trial or practice? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's a good point. Sharon says, why do they call it the failure laboratory? Because I guess you could say in improv, nothing's really a failure, right? It's just maybe it didn't work quite as good as something else. So I don't know. But that, that's what they do call it. But yeah, you're right, that's a little negative. <laughs> we get away from the negative. <laughs> yeah, the try it out laboratory. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? So, the title of my presentation is How Performing Improv Taught Me About Collaborative IT. So I guess at some point I have to tell you what I mean by collaborative IT. What are we talking about here? So let's talk for a couple minutes about the idea of collaborative IT. So I start with a definition. The definition of collaboration is working with others to achieve shared goals. So if we're talking about collaborative IT, 
I would say working with others not only means working within your own organization, your IT department with each other, but reaching outside of IT to work with the other people in your company. Right, we talk about this all the time, that IT is there to meet the needs of the business, to provide value to the business. Well, how do you do that? Well, you have to talk to everybody in the business to understand what those needs are. So working with others, both in IT and around my company. And then, of course, this definition also implies that we have goals, <laughs> so we know when we're achieving our goals, and that they are shared goals. So a collaborative environment, we're working with others, and we have shared goals that we're trying to achieve. Now, some of the characteristics, then, of collaborative IT. First of all, to me, there's a difference between collaborative IT and what you might think of as controlling IT. And let me give you an example. Let's, let's consider a CTO of an organization or a CIO. You know, the CIO, CTO of an organization. So what does a controlling CTO look like? I mean, a controlling CTO is the kind of person that keeps all the knowledge to themselves. The vendors are only allowed to talk to them because they don't want anybody else to know what's being discussed. Information is not readily shared. Uh, they, they are not excited about new technology. They kind of poo-poo new innovation. You know, the controlling CIO that wants to keep all things close to themselves, they end up saying no a lot. Now, how about the collaborative CIO? Well, the collaborative CIO would then invite everyone to the meeting that needs to be there, share the information you know, so that everyone knows what's going on, uh, that they would uh, really want to reach out to understand the needs of the business all throughout the company and make sure that they're meeting those needs and being flexible. I mean, the collaborative CIO would be the kind of person who would say yes and, as we're discussing here. So to me, you know, you don't want collaborative IT. I mean, I'm sorry, you don't want controlling IT. You want collaborative IT. Have you ever heard this expression, T-shaped professionals? A T-shaped professional, the horizontal line in the T, represents your broad social skills. So your adaptability, uh, the fact that you, know, you want to support collaboration, 360 degree thinking. You're curious about things. You have empathy to other people. So these are your social skills, the horizontal line. And then the vertical line in the T is your deep technical skill. So what is the technical skill that you bring to be able to do the job, creatively solve problems, do the things that you do? And so you can get the idea here. A T-shaped professional is someone that brings both of those characteristics to the job. So people today, employers today, they don't want people that are just really smart technically but can't get along with anybody, nor do they want people that get along with everybody fine but can't do anything technically. You know, they need both. And so to me, a collaborative IT environment would be made up of T-shaped professionals. Aligning technology with business, as I just said a moment ago. I mean, a collaborative IT environment is going to reach out and understand what does my business need and what can I do with the technology and IT to make sure I'm meeting those needs. And one of the ways we do that today is through agile development, if you're familiar with that IT term. The idea that we break down big monolithic applications that take years to develop and nobody knows how to test them and maybe they work and maybe they don't. And instead, we carve it up into small little pieces where the business and IT work together. We roll out these little pieces one function at a time to make sure that they're working and, and enabled to help the business, agile development. So to me, these are some of the characteristics of a collaborative IT organization. Not controlling, T-shaped professionals, aligned with the business, agile development. You agree, disagree? Any comments? Personal experiences? <laughs> we all work in fabulously wonderful collaborative IT environments. <laughs> I do. Yeah. Yeah. Let me note, Mo spoke that since his boss is sitting three <laughs> feet away. So that was a good move, Mo. Good job, Very good. <laughs> and Tracy, yes? So what do you do when you don't have all T-shaped professionals and you don't necessarily have all of those components? That's exactly what we're going to talk about for the rest of the session. You're going to use improvisational skill to make it better than it is, OK? <laughs> All right. I thought this was interesting. I found this several years ago. This guy, 
Thomas Friedman, he's a, a writer for the New York Times. He wrote an article, he did some research, how to get a job at Google. And what he found out were what the job characteristics are, what the people characteristics are that match jobs that Google is looking to fill. For example, the ability to process on the fly, a willingness to relinquish power, creating space for others to contribute, learning how to learn from failure. So these are the characteristics that Google looks like when they hire employees. I would say this also happens to be the perfect resume for a good improv actor. I mean, these are what improv actors need to do. They need to process on the fly, obviously. They need to relinquish power. You have to give and take. We're going to talk about that. They obviously need to create space so others can be part of the scene. You don't want to hog the whole thing yourself. And of course, as we discussed, you know, you have to be willing to fail and learn from those failures to get better the next time. So I just thought that was kind of interesting, that that matches very closely with what we're talking about here today is the characteristics of a good improv actor. Okay, so now what I want to do to answer Tracy's question for the rest of the presentation is to kind of look at three key tenets of good improvisation and explore a little bit more about how we can use those to build this collaborative IT environment. And so I begin with the one that is kind of the overarching theme of, of my talk, saying yes and. And I gave you an example of that with the scene that went awry with me and Chris uh, many years ago back at the Nightlight Playhouse. So you kind of get the idea that if you're going to create improvisation, if you're going to get up on the stage and make up a scene, you have to trust that the other actors on stage are all going to be saying yes and. You know, Chris was saying no. I didn't need him to say no. I needed him to say yes and, and that's what's going to build good improvisation. We do an exercise in class to kind of learn this technique. They call the exercise explore and heighten. And so you all get in a row, all the actors that are in the class, and you start out, the first guy in line starts with an object. Now remember, this is not a real object, right? We don't deal in real objects in improv, so you're holding some little object that you're miming. And let's say it's like a fountain pen or a blue, po blue point pen. A, Okay, so I got this pen, and the first guy takes the pen, and maybe he uses it to kind of draw a mustache on his face. And then he hands it to the next guy, and the next guy takes the pen, and maybe he uses it to, like, comb his hair. Then he hands it to the next guy. The next guy takes it, and he cleans his ear out with it. And then he hands it to the next guy, and the next guy unscrews the top of the pen and uses the bottom as a shot glass, you know, drinks all around. So you see what's going on there? Each person is taking the object, exploring it a little, handing it to the next guy who heightens even more what that person has done. And so you explore and heighten. And that's one of the ways that we teach people this whole idea of building, saying yes and, yes and, yes and. You know, yes, it can comb your hair and it can clean your ear. Yes, it can clean your ear and I can serve you a shot of tequila in it. You know, so I'm, I'm doing yes and, yes and. If you think about it for a minute, people who say no, or people who say yes but, are people who are trying to control the conversation and try to control the idea. They don't want to give it back to you. They want to keep it to themselves. Have you ever thought about what a lousy word but is? It's been a great conference this week, but. You know, the lunch was really nice today, but. I enjoyed that session a lot, but. You say, but, and what does it do? It negates everything you know, that you've said previously. I mean, it's a really lousy word from that perspective. And so rather than saying, but, saying yes, and. A couple examples in the industry we work in, open source to me is an example of saying yes, and. You know, I give you 10,000 lines of code, here, have it. You take it and you look at it and you add some more and you give it back, right? That's how open source works. So open source people are saying yes and they give it back to you. Or Wikipedia. Wikipedia is yes and, right? I put a definition out there of something, somebody takes it, says yes and, let me enhance that a little bit. So those are a couple examples, you know, in, in the tech world today of saying yes and. So. Let's look at a couple key components of yes and and see how this can relate to this whole idea of collaborative IT. First of all, yes and 
saying yes and affirms and builds. It affirms what someone has said and then it incrementally builds on what they have given you. It relates to business, I certainly think. Have you ever thought about what it would be like to be in a brainstorming session if everyone in the session is saying yes and? You know, great idea, yes, and let me add to it. Terrific idea, yes, and let me add to it. I mean, what kind of great brainstorming session that could be instead of people saying no but, you know, shut, shut, shutting it down before you even really get started. Or if you're trying to solve a problem together, you're in a room and you're all trying to solve a problem, people are saying yes, and. So I really think it does relate to business. This next one is real important. Saying yes and requires you to trust others to support and build on your contribution and you to do the same for them. It requires you to trust the other guy to take your contribution and support it and build on it. There's a concept when you're creating improvisational scenes and the concept is you bring a brick, not a cathedral. And so can you imagine what that means when you show up to create a scene? You bring one little piece that you're going to add to it. If you show up in your improv scene with the whole cathedral already constructed, what's going to happen? I mean, what are the other people going to do? They better go along with your cathedral, right? Because it's done. And so you really cut down and shut down the creativity if you bring the whole cathedral at the beginning. And so in improv, they say, bring a brick not a cathedral. In fact, there's a really interesting game that you play in class to kind of learn this. Again, you line all the actors up in the room and the exercise is called telling a story one word at a time. So there's a suggestion for a story, you know, fairy tale. And so you're all lined up and each actor contributes one word at a time. Once upon a time, there was a farmer. He lived in the village. You know, you're, you're one word at a time. And I gotta tell you, to do that, it's a really hard thing to do. Because as this story is unfolding, you are building a cathedral in your head. And when it's your turn, you can't lay it all out there. All you can do is put one word out there and hope that the next guy does the word you hope they do, right? To keep your cathedral being built the way you want it. It's a really difficult thing to do. So you have to trust others to support and build on your contribution, not to bring an entire cathedral. Do you have a comment? You look like you're ready to say something there, Marlon. No, I'm just intently listening. Intently listening. <laughs> Saying yes and, however, is not a replacement for quality or common sense. I mean, I can imagine somebody at this point going, what's going to happen if we say yes all the time? Yes, 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 we're going to end up with a disaster. And, I, and, and that's not what I'm saying. But think of it this way. There is a time and a place for filtering and editing. But to me, it's not at the beginning. You know, if you're working on something, you're trying to be creative, you're trying to get something going, you're saying yes and, yes and, yes and, then maybe eventually when something is coming to shape, you say, okay, now we gotta edit this a little, we gotta filter this a little. I mean, it's not like you're accepting all things forever. So it's not a replacement for quality or common sense. Uh, one example that comes to mind is like a sports team. At the beginning of a game, what does a sports team do? They come out on the field, they come out on the court, and they warm up, right? They throw the ball around, stretch, you know, do stuff. They're not following the rules of the game at that point. They're simply warming up. And so that's what we're doing here. We're saying yes and, we're warming up. And then eventually the game starts and then the players have to follow the rules once the game starts. And so then maybe that's where you do a little filtering and editing. Saying yes and gives you the confidence to create something out of nothing. So to me, these are some of the characteristics that I think would apply to building a collaborative IT environment or any collaborative environment, not just in IT by being willing to say yes and. Any thoughts about that? Comments? Well, that fourth bullet messed me up because I was gonna go to my manager and try to fly business class with the yes and. Mm -hmm. But now, common sense <laughs> is gonna say no. I'm sorry, Mo. <laughs> you were gonna take yes and to the extreme. Huh? <laughs> I get business class, I get the penthouse, yes and, yes and, yes and, yeah. 
All right, no, I'm sorry. There is a little uh, common sense that has to come into play. Yeah. Yes, yes, and the flight will go to Kansas City. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts? You agree, disagree, make sense? Still thinking about it. You know, there's a lot of talk in business these days about team. You know, you hear it said, you know, the manager's building their team. We're all going to go off and do some team building exercises. You know, we talk a lot in business about team. The definition of team is a number of persons forming one of the sides in a game or a contest. So to me, this implies a couple of things. It implies that there's you versus somebody else, that there could be winners and losers. It implies often when you think about a team that there are the starters and then there's the bench players who maybe aren't as important or don't matter as much as the starters. To me, there's a whole bunch of negative connotations around the word team when you apply it to a, a business sort of sense. Now, at the Second City, the actors who form the troupe who are on stage from night after night, they refer to them as an ensemble. And I think this is a much nicer word to use than team. The definition of an ensemble is that all the parts of the thing are taken together so that each part is considered only in relation to the whole. So we're looking at each part, yes, but only as it fits in the entire ensemble. You kind of get this competitive thing out of there from using the word team. Now it's interesting, those of you that have gone to Second City here in Chicago, if you go multiple times, like I've done over my life, Obviously, from show to show, from year to year, the troupe changes. It's not the same actors. People come, people go, and new people come in and take over. But what you notice is that their ensemble is always made up of kind of the same sort of characters. So there's the overweight, goofy guy, and there's the, you know, the sexy lady, and there's a suave, sophisticated guy, and there's the actor and the actress that can do impersonations of other people. You know, there's this set of things that make up the ensemble. And so you go and you see the show, and then you go back a year later, and the overweight, goofy guy is gone, but he's been replaced with another overweight, goofy guy. You know? And so they have these parts that are interchangeable because they've created this notion of the ensemble, and that's, what, that's what's needed to do good improvisation. So how can you help your team become an ensemble. Okay, let's look at a couple ideas here. The first one is be in the moment. Now, in improvisation, what this means is don't worry about the last scene you did. Don't be thinking about the next scene you're gonna do. You know, be focused on the scene you're doing right now. Be in the moment. In fact, there's an exercise that we do in class where two actors stand facing each other and one actor is doing things, and the other actor is supposed to be a mirror, as if they're looking in the mirror. And so the mirror person has to be right there watching you. If I'm scratching my nose, the mirror's scratching his nose. You know, if I brush my head, he's brushing his head. I mean, and you really gotta be in the moment to keep that going. Because if you just lapse for a second, you know, suddenly I'm rubbing my chin and you're still scratching my head, you know, the mirror's not working anymore. So that's being in the moment. Now in life, think about this. How often are you standing around talking to somebody and all of a sudden they pull out their cell phone and start texting? You know, or they start looking through their emails while you're standing there trying to have a conversation with them. I and mean, that is somebody that is not in the moment. I live, at, uh, I live at home. Yes, I live at home. I also work at home. I also work at home. And, and so uh, for many of us that are on our team together, our meetings are always conference calls. And so you get on a conference call, and of course there's a whole bunch of people on the call, and you can hear their voices, but you can't see them. And so the discussion is going on, and all of a sudden somebody will say, you know, Joe, what do you think about that? Joe, Joe, you there, Joe? And finally you hear Joe, he comes on, he says, uh, could you repeat the question, please? And then you have to go through the whole thing all over again. Well, what was Joe doing? Who knows? <laughs> he was doing his email, reading the paper, taking a nap, but Joe was not in the moment. You know, and I think there's an issue here of respect. If you're building an ensemble, you need to be in the moment. You know, you've sat in conference rooms before where you're trying to solve a problem and the guy at the end of the table is doing email, right? He's not paying any attention. He's not in the moment. 
So it's really an, an issue of respect. I think is, this is one way you build an ensemble, is that everyone in the ensemble is in the moment. You make the effort to do that. Give and take. Now in improv, I described this a little bit, this is so important in an improv scene, that if I give, somebody else has to be willing to take, and, and then they need to be eventually willing to give so someone else can take. I mean, give and take is what makes the scene work well. It's gonna really be a mess. If everybody on stage is only giving and no one's taking, it's even worse if everyone on stage is only taking and no one's giving, you know, nothing's happening to the scene. And so you really need give and take. Again, we play a game where you all kind of get in a circle and one, and, and one person takes the focus and then in some way they give the focus to someone else. You know, maybe I give it to Mo by saying, you know, great conference, huh? You know, and then Mo would know that I was giving it to him and he would take it and he would go with it. Maybe it would be my words, maybe it'd be my voice, maybe it'd be a gesture. You know, somehow I give to Mo and then Mo knows to take. And so you learn this in class, how to do give and take on stage. So think about if you're in a meeting. I mean, what does a good meeting need? A good meeting needs givers and takers, right? Everybody in the meeting's given. If everybody in the meeting's taking, you know, nothing's really getting done. And so again, to me, another characteristic of an ensemble are people who are willing to do give and take. Surrender the need to be right. Oh, shucks. Oh, shucks, Sharon says. <laughs> Let me tell you a story to illustrate this. Throughout my life, one of the places where I've had the opportunity to perform improv and use my improv skill has been at the church that I go to. Uh, we have an acting troupe at the church, and from time to time, the minister of the church will ask our troupe to create a scene to illustrate his sermon that he's preaching on Sunday morning in the service. So for example, if he's gonna talk about honesty, you know, he might ask us to create a little scene that, that we could do in the service that would illustrate honesty or something like that. And so the way this works is, you know, the pastor will get in touch with me in the middle of the week and he'll say, can you, can you guys do a scene on honesty? So I send an email to all the members and say, okay, the theme is honesty, let's meet on Saturday morning and we will use improvisational technique. Nobody writes a script. We all just get together and we improvise until we've come up with a scene that has something to do with honesty for the church service. There is one guy in our group and when he comes to that rehearsal every Saturday morning, he brings a cathedral and he's always right. And that makes it really difficult to be creative with the group because he's got the whole scene already figured out and he knows he's right. You know, he does not want to surrender, you know, that he might actually be wrong. And it really shuts down creativity, really a hard thing to get around. And so think about that in your day-to-day -day job, you know, surrendering your need to have to always be right. Sorry, Sharon, but it helps build an ensemble. <laughs> yes. How do you work around that? You just, you, you gotta just kinda nibble away at it and say, look, you know, that's a pretty good idea, let's keep part of it, but can we maybe try this other idea that Scott just offered, you know, and you, you try to uh, collaborate, you know, do collaborative work together, but maybe keep a little of what he brought, you know, keep part of his cathedral, but replace part of it with somebody else, that, that kind of thing. But it's a negotiation, it's, it's tough sometimes. Saying yes and, builds better ensembles. Can you believe that? Some of the couple things I've shared with you here. So, so if the first point is collaborative IT, saying yes and. My second point here, collaborative IT, is turning your team into an ensemble, building an ensemble. Make sense? Any other thoughts, comments? It's Friday afternoon, right? You're just, we've worn you out this week. I know when, when when our team has we have team meetings and you know we were creating something new this year. It was kind of like getting everybody to toss out ideas and spitball, and we we as a team work really well. So it's not you get a lot of yes ands. So it, yes. it works that way because a lot of people have it, it's not it's not the starting players and the bench players. It's just whether 
this is your area of expertise or that is your area of expertise. Yeah. And if you can collaborate and get all of that. Yeah, that, if everybody's on the same level, as you said, and everybody's saying yes and, really cool things happen. That's right, absolutely. In, in my team, we've got a couple Americans, and we're happy to share our opinions. <laughs> and then you got uh, people in Spain, and they really like to share their opinions. <laughs> <laughs> and then most of the people who are very bright are in Sweden, and they're very quiet. And so it's hard to get them to... Uh, yeah, know, that, that's a great point that, that you bring different cultures into this, and different cultures bring different styles of behavior. That's right, so you have to just work a little harder. I mean, I've had people ask me in this session before, well, how do you take those quiet people and, and get them to contribute? And you just, to me, you just have to kind of bring them along, you know, keep coming back to them. You know, Mo's not a quiet guy, but, you know, Mo, you know, could you, you know, what do you think about that? You know, Mo, could you, you know, can you offer an idea there? I mean, you just, it seems to me you have to try to work at it to, to get those people. And hopefully other people, if you're giving it to the Swedish folks in your example, hopefully nobody takes it until they've you know, initiated something, right? So you want to give and then hope that they take it and, and keep it for a while, yeah. It, it might be just making them comfortable. Because I know within, uh, within, within our team, we've got people who are extroverts and we have introverts. But I know that the introverts are comfortable in their situation or in the, in the group. So they're relatively vocal you know, even amongst extroverts, you know, because it's it really that's more of a way of learning. But the introverts in my team are are not quiet, but that's because they're comfortable speaking up in the small audience. They're not going to be the ones standing up on stage. Yeah, that's another thing. If you've got a small enough group, maybe yeah. that encourages the quieter people to speak up a little more than if it's a big giant meeting. Yeah, they're, that kind of thing. yeah. They're, they're not going to speak up in front of yeah. twenty five people. Yeah, yeah. Anything else? I think conference call meetings just really yeah, are tough. They are. Because uh, the give and take, sometimes you have people talking over other people. <coughs> then you have someone same timing you saying, aren't you going to speak up about this? And you don't have a chance. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Because other yeah. people aren't talking over each other. Yeah. And it's, it's, you really have to be patient. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, conference calls are tough. Uh, that's really changed the whole uh, dynamic of meetings, really, as it shifted. John? Yeah, I was going to say, you know, so who's ever the leader there, um, you know, one of the things, and you probably said it here, but you have to be very conscious to get go kind of around the table and, you know, maybe not formally, but get their opinions mm -hmm. on this, like, like so and so, or, you know, what do you think about this? Yeah. How do you feel about it? What are the pluses? Yeah. Because some people don't want to initiate or lead or be wrong, but if you give someone the opportunity. Yeah. I would say a good leader of a conference call calls on each person by name, and hopefully everybody else shuts up long enough to let that person speak if they haven't been speaking. You know? like Dale Turner, you said everyone likes to hear their name. So when you go to somebody, yeah. Glenn, what do, you, what do you think about We just yes. heard A, B, and C, we're kind of in between your pluses yeah. and minus. No, you're absolutely right, John. If you call somebody by name, that, that means something. Even on a call, I think that's helpful, yeah. That's a good, good point. Okay, my third area, listening. Now again, you can imagine, if you're on stage doing improv, you have to be listening to what the other people on stage are doing. That's what builds good improv. There's an exercise that we played uh, to reinforce this point in class. The exercise would be like if Mo and I were teamed up, we would sit here and we would start having a conversation. And the rule of the game is that when Mo has finished talking, I have to use the last word he said to be the first word of my sentence. So it forces you to listen all the way to the end, you know, to pick up his last word. That's how you successfully play the game, and then you use that word. Uh, th there's uh, sort of some unwritten rules about improv. Asking questions on stage is, is kind of a no-no. Because that means you really weren't listening, you really weren't contributing, you're just trying to throw the focus right back. You know, Mo goes through this nice, lovely explanation of, you know, what's wrong in his life, and, and when he's done, you know, he's hoping I will contribute, and instead, as his fellow actor, all I do is say, why? <laughs> so I just gave it right back to him, you know? I mean, I really wasn't listening to what he was saying. And so there's these kind of rules that you really have to listen. 
And so let's talk a little bit about listening in the whole context of this collaborative IT discussion that we're having. So first of all, as I just said, great listening is at the core of great improvisation. I'm on stage with other actors. I want something wonderful to unfold on stage that the audience is gonna like. And if to do that, I have to be listening. And so listening is really at the core of great improvisation. There's a concept called follow the follower. This is kind of interesting. There's a game that we play where you all get in a circle and one person starts out as the leader. And so what they do, everybody follows. So let's say the leader starts clapping. So everybody sees the leaders clapping, so they are start clapping. And then whenever they want, someone else decides they're gonna be the leader without any spoken word. So suddenly they switch from clapping to you know, patting their head. So everybody has to notice that now, oh, now Glenn's become the leader, and so we're all gonna do what Glenn's gonna do, so we pat it, you know, patting heads. And then a few minutes later in the circle, you know, Marlon decides he's gonna be the leader, so he just starts humming. And so everyone kind of reads, oh, I see Marlon's the leader now, so hmm, 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 we all start humming to follow Marlon. So you're not following the leader, you're following the follower, right? The, the person who followed the follower who followed the follower. And so there's this concept. I think this is important. To me, leadership is not about sustaining the, the status and, and maintaining what's going on with the status. It's about simply understanding the status. Okay, leadership is not about maintaining the status. It's about understanding the status. Different people should from time to time be able to be the leader. And in improv, if it's the same guy all the time initiating, the same guy taking focus, pretty soon it just becomes a monologue. It's not a, an ensemble exercise, you know, where everyone is working together. And so you have to follow the follower. And right along with this, I think, goes this next one, reading the room. That is your ability to look at everyone and get a sense of what is going on with everyone in the room. So I'm gonna read the room, I'm gonna understand what's going on, and then I'm gonna follow the follower. There's a, a legendary story about this at Second City. Apparently, one time, an organization was holding a conference like this, and they invited someone from Second City, one of the actors from Second City, to come and give a speech. Well, when the actor showed up to give his speech in front of the group, apparently there was some sort of misunderstanding and the group thought that the speaker that was coming was an expert in their particular area, whatever that area was. But the guy that showed up didn't know anything about their area. Undaunted, he decided to give the speech anyway. And so he gets up in front of the room, doesn't know anything about what these people are, are there about, and he starts out by saying, so, what is the biggest challenge you're all facing today? And someone offers a comment and he says, yeah, that's a really tough challenge. What can we do about that? And so people start offering solutions and he kind of summarizes, what's another challenge you're facing today? And people offer, and he went on like this for an hour. And at the end of the hour, he gets a standing ovation. He gave this entire talk, didn't know anything about what he was talking about. But what he was doing was reading the room and following the follower. And that's how he got through that speech without knowing what he was talking about. Make mistakes work for you. There's a, a thing that we do in improv. When you do scene after scene after scene, you don't want to always use your name because it gets kind of confusing. I mean, one scene, Glenn is a scientist, and the next scene, Glenn is a baker, and the next scene, you know, Glenn is a mountain climber, so it gets a little confusing. So what you do is you just choose another name for the scene, so you're always having a different name in different scenes. Well, you can imagine this gets a little confusing. Sometimes you forget, <laughs> you know, what, what's his name in this scene? You know, I, I, I kind of forgot. And so there was a scene we were doing one time, and I was Joe. And so I was Joe, and the guy that was doing the scene with me forgot that my name was Joe and mistakenly called me Fred. Well, the audience all knew that he'd screwed up. And I knew that he'd screwed up, but he didn't realize that he had screwed up. So rather than simply calling him on the mistake, I decided to make the mistake work for me. And so he calls me Fred, and I like, you know, look really surprised and I go, who told you what my secret identity was? 
And so I set the scene off, you know, in a whole different direction. If he's going to change my name, fine, we'll change the name, and that'll be part of the scene. So make mistakes work for you. Listening to respond versus listening to understand. See, there's a difference there. What most people do is merely listen to respond. You're waiting for the other person to finish so you can say something back. And so often, you know, what they say about bad listening is you've stopped listening to the person because you're formulating the answer in your head that you want to offer as soon as it's your turn to speak. You know, you want to show them you're right. You know, you want to respond with what you've got to say versus kind of like the example, the, the acting example where you have to listen to the very last word, listening to understand. I'm listening to you because I really want to understand what you're saying. And when you're all done, then I will, you know, look through and digest what you have said and, and formulate a response. I'm not just hanging on the edge, waiting to respond as fast as I can. So I think there's a difference there. Listening to respond, which is what we usually do, versus listening to understand. So these are some of my thoughts about listening. My idea for this presentation came from a book that was written not too long ago called Yes And, Lessons from the Second City. How improvisation reverses no but thinking and improves creativity and collaboration. It was written by a couple guys who work at the Second City here in Chicago. And interestingly enough, what they do is they run the arm of Second City that does business consulting. So your business can hire Second City and they'll come out and play those games with you that I was telling you about this afternoon and try to help you become a more collaborative organization. So that's something they do as a, as a revenue generating thing. And so the guys that run that, they wrote this book called Yes And. And so if you are interested in this subject, if you'd like to read more a little bit about Second City and a lot more about the things we've been talking about here this afternoon, uh, I would recommend this book. It was published just a few months ago, so you can find it on Amazon. It's easy to find and, and, and order. Now, what they did in this book is at the end of this book, they provided a list of about 20 or 25 suggestions. I call it advice from the world of improv. And so I'd like to share this list with you here to kind of summarize what we've been talking about. So this is their list, advice from the world of improv. Uh, as I show these to you one at a time, if they trigger a comment, feel free to just uh, share anything that you think. So first of all, look people in the eye when you meet them. It means you're connected, right? You're paying attention. You're looking someone in the eye when you meet them. Smile. You smile, people love it. When people are happy, people like it when people are happy. So smile as you go through life. Small thing, but really a big thing. Don't check your texts or email when someone else is talking. That's the whole respect thing that we talked about earlier. Be curious. Improvisers are curious people, trying to you know, explore and heighten what's going on. You know, let's figure out all the interesting little details. Try to eliminate the word no from your vocabulary for just one day. Think you could do that? <laughs> Mark's laughing in the back, all right. <laughs> there you go, yes. I hear that comment often. If you do hear Tracy says, I have children at home, I'm not sure I can do that. <laughs> kind of a hard thing to do. Can I do it only on weekends? Only on weekends, all right. So not to your employees, just your wife? Is that what you're saying, Mark? <laughs> It's not my employees that are my problem. <laughs> <laughs> Try business class. Yeah, fly business class. Yeah. <laughs> when you are wrong, acknowledge it, say you're sorry, move on. Forgive yourself and forgive others. Everybody's going to screw up sooner or later, right? So be willing to forgive both yourself and others. Lead as you would want to be led, kind of the golden rule, right? Be on time. Yes. Let me tell you, nothing can be a cancer on an ensemble quicker than someone who's never on time for meetings, on time for activities, things like that. That can really destroy an ensemble. If you're trying to build an ensemble, everybody needs to be on time. Excel at preparation. Be prepared for what you're supposed to be doing. Now you might say, 
I just spent the last hour talking about improv, and now you're telling me to prepare? <laughs> that you were telling me to improvise. In fact, it was kind of funny when I was younger and I was in that troupe, someone would ask me, one of my friends, what are you doing tonight? I'd say, oh, I'm going to improv practice. They kind of look at you funny like, wait a minute, you practice improv? <laughs> I thought that was the point, there was no practice, but actually you do, you practice all those games and exercises like I was talking about. Ask yourself, what is the problem you're trying to solve? If any of you have been to my technical presentations this week, you know this is my favorite question. What is the problem you're trying to solve? You know, the answer is cloud. Yeah, well, what's the problem you're trying to solve? The answer is cognitive. The answer is blockchain. You know, what is the problem you're trying to solve? You really need to always start by asking that question. Make your partner look good. Again, in improv, I mean, people want to improvise with each other because they make each other look good on stage. Unlike my buddy Chris in my story, who made me look bad, you know, because he was saying no instead of saying yes and. Make your partner look good. Respect, don't revere. To me, the word revere means that you're not even willing to change something. You're just going to always leave it the way it is. To me, if you respect something, you can still be willing to change it. You can respect it, but be willing to change it. So I would say respect, don't revere. Listen to the whole person. We didn't really talk about this much, but beyond listening to the words, of course, is the body language, right? Read the room, as we said. What are people thinking in terms of their emotions and their body language as they're talking to you? you know, listen to the whole person when you're talking to somebody. Read the room, we talked about that earlier. Share the conversation. You know, don't be a controlling CIO, be the collaborative CIO, the ones that shares information, that shares the conversation. Love your work. Do you love your work? I love my job. I, I have a great time. I enjoy it very, very much. I hope you all <laughs> love your work. If you don't, try to finagle things around a little so you do love your work. Applaud others. Everybody does a good job. Everybody needs a little applause. Applaud other people. Say we rather than I whenever possible. I think that's a really great suggestion to build an ensemble, to say we. Consider that you might not be right. Don't be like my friend that brings a cathedral every time to the rehearsal. You might not always be right. Open your door, <coughs> literally. If you work in an office, open your door. <laughs> Let people see you in there. Who knows what might happen when, when they walk by. Try not to work out of fear. Work from a sense of possibility. You know, don't be afraid of what's going to happen. Think about the possibilities that you can create by improvising. Understand the audience you're trying to win over and give them a role. In improv, we give the audience the role of providing suggestions. So they all have skin in the game, right? They like yelled out the suggestion. So if the scene doesn't work, it's kind of partially their fault. It was a crummy suggestion. <laughs> so you give the people a role, the people that you're trying to win over. I, I shared this the other day, and someone in the audience told a story. They said they were part of a board of directors of an organization. And there was a member of the organization that just ragged on them constantly. Everything was wrong. Everybody was stupid. The board was doing everything wrong, making horrible decisions, you know, on and on and on. And so what did they do? They asked her to join the board, right? And she was like shocked. And she said, you know, don't you people all hate me? And we're like, well, we want you on the board. You know, bring your ideas to the board. Give somebody a role, you know, somebody that you're trying to win over. Be an improviser. Maybe you didn't know much an hour ago about improvising, but hopefully you know a little bit more now, but it means to be an improviser. And the best way to be an improviser is to go through life saying yes and. Thank you very much for coming, for listening, for participating. It's been great to have you here. Great to have you at the entire conference. Hope you've had a good, uh, good week. And maybe we'll see you at the next one somewhere down the line. Thanks.